We're in New York City, baby. Hey, ma'am, fam, we're here in New York City for one day, and we're gonna make the most of it. We are gonna do a tour. We've got a new show to see, a museum. You know we're gonna have good eats, and we're starting right here. No, not Starbucks. Let's so let's go. go. We are starting our day with a New York and world landmark, if we're being honest, the Empire State Building. I've actually never been here before. Have you? Yeah, I've been here. When did you come here? Uh, I came here a very long time ago, and I only ever went up to the 86th floor for the little observatory area, the deck. Oh, well, there's a 102nd floor observatory now. There are a variety of ways to see the Empire State Building, but you do have to have a ticket to get up to the observatories. There are two observatories on the 86th and the 102nd floor. There are regular tickets that just get you up to one of them that start at $45. Then you can get up to both of them for about 80. You can get express to skip the lines at the elevators, or you can do the VIP experience. This is actually what we booked. It's $175 a person, which is a lot but it's not that much more than just doing express to get up to the two different observation decks. And we are gonna have a guide that takes us through front of the line access that comes with souvenir photos and a private tour explaining details and history and fun facts about one of the most famous buildings in the world. I'm super duper excited. You know I love fun facts and I can't wait to get up there and see New York. We checked in the beautiful lobby for the tour, and just as a heads up, this was a very small tour. There's only two other people on it, so the clips from this are going to be a mixture of voiceover we filmed afterwards based on notes we took, as well as the audio we captured of the actual tour guide as a courtesy to the other guests. When it was originally built, the Empire State Building was 1,250 feet tall. Now it is 1,454 feet with an antenna added in 1962 for radio and TV stations. And within it, there are 77 operating elevators. The craziest part about this is that the Empire State Building was built in a year and 45 days. That's four and a half stories a week, which is just mind boggling. The Empire State Building was built in one year and 45 days. We had six deaths this week during the construction of this building. Yes, six people died during the construction. So all of this is 92 years old. And this is 92 years old. The ceiling. This is a symbol for the restoration of our marble. When we did the ceiling, we restored our marble. It is original marble, but we restored it. Okay? Each piece is matching each other. We call it matching. From 1931, and we still use these mailboxes today. Lo and behold, the Empire State Building has its own zip code. So we do not share our zip code with across the street. Next door, we have our own. Wow. Okay, so when you mail a letter from here, it will have the Empire State Building zip code on it. Renita just told us it's going to take three elevators. tallest building in the world for over 40 years. And then the Twin Towers took over for five years. They have a We are not even the tallest building in New York anymore. So we have the Freedom Tower, which is the new World Trade Center. And we have the Central Park Tower, which is a residential building on Central Park West that is taller than us. It is Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and of course, New York City. There is your anemometer what the building is made of. Limestone from Indiana. You say you help the Empire State. Building. That's right. Yes. yes. That's what the outside of this building is made of. Oh, it is 92 heavy. years old. Located at the top of the first floor lobby, there were 13 plaques showcasing the different trades used to build the Empire State Building, from things like stoneworking to electricians to plumbing. And what's fascinating is that at times there were over 3,400 tradespeople on site building this building. This AT&T store, they turned it into a toy store for Elf. We just found out they had to take the buttons out of the elevators because of that movie, because everybody would do the thing and go, it looks like a Christmas tree on the observatory elevators. When an alarm goes off, we know exactly where that alarm is by looking at this. Before, this is the old, 
things would light up and we would have to search it out. Okay, so what happens is our elevators are recalled to the lobby. No one can get on the elevators until the fire department clears it. Sometimes it could be a false alarm, sometimes not. But we know exactly where the fire is, the alarm is. It could be a very small thing, whatever it is that brings up the alarm. After the first floor, we went up to a small museum that had things like blueprints, schematics, the survey marker. There was a really cool time-lapse video watching the Empire State Building be built. We learned more here about how it was constructed and the different people that worked on it. And there was a fun photo op with the famous picture of the guys having their lunch up on the beams. We got to see the inner workings of the original elevator here, as well as step into the original that had been put on display. And this is what you saw as you were riding up to the 102nd floor. It would tell you how many feet you were going, as well as 150 feet, 102 floors. Well, the elevator today that we have tells you how many feet, how many meters, and what floor you're going to. <laughs> museum continued with which companies have offices in the buildings as well as the most famous building in the world and how it's appeared in pop culture, including a fun photo op with its most famous appearance. We actually learned that King Kong was a marketing ploy by the Empire State Building because of the Great Depression and let's say it worked. So now we are called Empire State Building Trust. So this man right here, Mr. Anthony Malkin, who is my boss. <laughs> But before, it was him, his dad, his wife, and his mother. Oh, wow. That owned the Empire State Building. It was in a family thing. It was generated from a family. So we use a remote for our elevators. As you see, she has in her hand, we use to operate our elevators. Whoa. She's in charge? She's in charge. <laughs> After our first long elevator ride, we made a stop on the 86th floor. This is where the outdoor observatory is, but we came back to that in a little bit. What we did do is check out the artwork done by Stephen Whitshire. He is an autistic artist from the UK who uses his photographic memory to draw landscapes. Look at this picture of New York. Wow. Five days and we drew it Five by days. memory. Five days. From a 45 minute helicopter ride. I was totally impressed. Wow. He's autistic. We got back on the elevator and made it all the way up to the 102nd floor for the 360 degree view of New York City. Wow, this is amazing. Look, there's the Statue of Liberty all the way out there. There's the financial district right in front of us. The one tower. And relax, okay? There's a Flatiron building in the middle of the street. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the good Flatiron building right there. It, it was the first uh, skyscraper in New York City. These are our very important bridges. If you think of the acronym BMW, you will always remember your bridges. <laughs> so we're going to start with the right to the left, behind the brown building, that little brown building we have what we call our Brooklyn Bridge. The one with the tower in front of it is the Manhattan Bridge. And this one is the Williamsburg Bridge. This is New Jersey on the Hudson on the Hudson River on the west. This is the Hudson River right here. And this is the East River right here. Over here we have the Chrysler Building, who we were in competition with when we were being built. The one with the spire. You see it? That's the Chrysler Building. We're taller than that. Bridge, now. Yes, we're definitely <laughs> tall. It's the tallest building over here. That was the first tall residential building to be built on that side. That's so, straight up and down one? That's that straight kinda, up and down yeah. one that looks like a Rubik's Cube. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Inside, it is called the Reservoir, the Jackie Alexis Reservoir, and the park is called Central Park. So that's how good you can see it from above, 102 floors. You will not see it like that when you get to the 86th floor. Behind Central Park, you're going to see Yankee Stadium. We headed back down to the 86th floor observatory, which was really cool because we got to see not only the city, but how big the antenna was, and Renita took some great photos. And after our wonderful tour throughout the Empire State Building, we now find ourselves in the gift shop. It's the official store, because what would an attraction be without a gift shop? 
True. Got the classic I Heart New York collection, which I'm gonna be honest, go to any gift shop on the street. <laughs> and not this, but what I don't think you can find at the gift shops on the street. Uh, King Kong taking a selfie? The, the King Kong collection. That is nice, but I think, do, you, do we need this? I don't think so. But why? It's so nice. I do like that under the Empire Memory sign, it's um, the Avengers, because we all remember the time they destroyed New York. They did do that. Ah, uh, memories. I don't need another mug, but I do like this marble one looking one. Okay, let's be real. You'd get this one. Oh, the big version? I didn't even see that. Oh, do I need this gigantic mug? For your half pot of coffee in the morning? That is nice. Really leaning into the King Kong thing. Yes, they are. Yep. This is probably my favorite thing we've seen so far, is they have a whole collection with the Stephen Wiltshire artwork on it that we saw upstairs. There's t-shirts, mugs, prints, and postcards if you wanted to take home that amazing artwork. I think there might be more Kong merch here than in a theme park. That's quite possible. They really like King Kong here, which you know what? They should. And you know what? I really like this. I mean, it is his origin story. That's amazing. <laughs> it's Renita. She's here. She was the best. That was really, really fun. Now, I've never been to the Empire State Building. I've seen it, obviously. Uh, but going up to the top, to the 102nd floor, and having a private tour overlooking everything, I mean, what of you? And I've been here before, but only to the 86th floor in the observatory, not to the 102nd. Uh, and just a massive shout out to Renita, who was our guide. Is the store expensive? Yes. But to have somebody take you up to the 102nd floor, show you all the buildings around this 360 view of New York City, uh, to have the photos included that you get taken, I mean, it was just, it was just breathtaking. Plus, not only did we get like the souvenir photos, but Renita knows the angle. She knows where to pose for pictures, and she got some of the best pictures that we have, I think. Obviously, the tour, like Alan said, is expensive, but you should come to the Empire State Building if you're coming to New York. I mean, it's a classic New York thing. It's, been, it's like my fifth trip here, and I'm finally doing it. I would say regardless, I would have booked the Express if we were going to do the tour, um, just because it does get very, very busy. It's the number one tourist attraction in the world, so you can be waiting in a long line to get to those observatories, but there's an Express option that allows you to go in a shorter line for the elevators. Um, the one thing I didn't love about the tour is that we don't get to see all the exhibits in their fullest extent, but we had like a private guy telling us what to look at, but we didn't get to like look through all the little things and stuff, but it was really cool. It was amazing. And now I'm hungry. I'm also hungry. Food. Yes. Are we eating in the Empire State Building? Yes. So if you want to eat somewhere in the Empire State Building, you can book a reservation. They have a couple different restaurants inside of here. We have a reservation for Tacombi, which is a Mexican taco restaurant. Um, I read a bunch of reviews online. A lot of people enjoy it. There's a bunch of different Tacombis around New York um, and a few other places as well, but obviously we want to eat at the one here. We also are mailing our postcard that we got on the tour in the mailbox because Renita, our amazing guide, told us that the Empire State Building has its own zip code. So now when it arrives to us, it'll be stamped from the Empire State Building. Tacombi's menu is unique in that they give you a sheet to fill out and you add how many of each item you'd like. They've got starters like guacamole and cortesquites. They're known for their tacos and tostadas. They have a variety of different proteins and toppings. They've got quesadillas, burritos as well, and then a slew of craft cocktails, including, of course, margaritas and other tequila and mezcal beverages. And if you couldn't tell, we were pretty hungry. So we started with the cornesquites, then picked up the beef birria taco, al pastor, carnitas, carne asada, the avocado tostada, and the Baja crispy fish tacos. We also nabbed the Norteña quesadilla, and then for beverages, Molly picked up a spicy margarita, and I nabbed a Paloma. The corn esquites were delicious. There was plenty of cheese and a nice spicy sauce over the top of it, and the corn was cooked wonderfully. Also, the portion size was not small. There was plenty to share. I really enjoyed this as a starter. Kicking off the taco experience with the beef bidia tacos, the savory spicy biscuit recipe from Jalisco with the au jus was so good. It might be my favorite taco of the bunch with the hearty broth, 
the delicious meat that's just so tender and juicy. It was just so rich and delicious. I'm actually salivating now and dreaming about this taco. And I also tried the carne asada, which is Sonoran style thinly sliced beef. This was very tasty and light, certainly a change from the beef video taco. I really enjoyed this. It just tasted very fresh and clean. Up next, I had the carnitas taco, which was slow roasted pork that I was told was roasted in beer. It was so juicy and moist, and you could taste a little bit of that beer coming through, paired with cilantro and the vegetables on the taco. This one in the top three. For my first taco, well, not ever, but here was the Baja Crispy Fish. This is beer battered Pacific cod. It's got a crema on top as well as some crispy vegetables. This was actually voted the best fish taco in New York City by the New York Times. And oh my gosh, I can tell why. The fish is light and crispy. Even with that batter, it's not too heavy. You've got the crema that adds a little bit of brightness as well as the vegetables to add a crunch. This was fantastic. Fresh lime squeezed on top. I could have eaten like four of just these tacos. Also, per the recommendation of the manager, tried the Al Pastor taco. This is a Mexico City style marinated pork. It comes with pineapple. I'm not even the biggest pineapple fan, but this was fantastic. This is that taco with the big meat coat that you can see back in the kitchen. It was light. It was juicy. And when you added that smoky chipotle house-made salsa on top, this was an awesome, awesome taco. I would recommend this one too. Here's the avocado tostada, which has got avocado, beans, queso fresco, and pickled red onions on top. Everything here is fresh and delicious. The avocados were perfect. And I love the acidity from the pickled red onions. That said, I did prefer the tacos over the tostada at the end of the day. And lastly, try the Norteña quesadilla, which is similar to the carne asada taco. It's the Sonoran style thinly sliced beef. It had some cheese and some crema on top. This was the most unique quesadilla I've ever gotten because it was served open face. So I kind of folded it over into a half quesadilla, half taco situation. This was very good, similar flavor again to the carne asada. However, I don't prefer this presentation as much as I did the tacos. So while the flavor was excellent, next time I'm just going to get tacos. I picked up the Paloma to drink, which was tequila and fresh grapefruit juice. And you could certainly tell it was fresh grapefruit because of the bite it had. I really enjoyed this and I would 100% try again for how light and refreshing it was. I enjoyed the spicy margarita, which lived up to its name. It was a classic, simple lime margarita and had just enough hit where I could taste the spice, but it wasn't overdone. It really balanced out the natural sweetness from the cocktail. This was a very good, nothing super exciting, but very classic and solid drink. Well, that was a delicious lunch. So delicious. I love the sauces yeah. so much that I put one in my bag. Just kidding. The manager gave it to me. <laughs> he came over to ask how the food was and we were raving about it. And I was raving about this Chipotle salsa. And then he came back with a bottle as a surprise, which is very, very sweet. So Tacombi, highly recommend. There's many locations around the city, but delicious. Very tasty. And now we are on to our next venture. The Museum of Broadway. It's up there. There. Up there. We're going to go inside. As the name would suggest, the Museum of Broadway is a museum dedicated to Broadway, including the props and costumes and some interactive exhibits all about some of the wonderful shows that have graced the stages of Broadway over the years. Tickets to the Museum of Broadway start at $34 and you'd have to select a time slot to visit the museum, but you can upgrade for a small fee and have the flex pay ticket and come whenever you'd like. These playbills have every show running on Broadway right now. We've seen that one. Seen this one, but not on Broadway. Saw that one in Orlando. Seen that one, seen that one. Maybe over here is a hint to what we're doing later today. It's going to be awesome. This is really cool. Four, almost 15 million people went to Broadway shows in 2018 to 2019. That'd be the year before the pandemic. And it says that 35% of that audience is local. This is the wildest. $14.7 billion are contributed to the New York City economy because of Broadway and almost 100,000 jobs. Moving through some of the exhibits. This is from 1891. Mm. My brain like does not comprehend such a thing. The 150th performance of men and women. These costumes are 116 years old. They're from the theater that Disney's in charge of. They signed a 99 year contract with them and they found them there. They're from 1907. Aren't they beautiful? Look at how like intricate all the beading is. Here's a costume as well as pages from Showboat, including an original 
program from the 1920s. And now we have moved into a display showing a lot of different photos and programs and as well as it looks to be some fields of Roger and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. You feel like you're at home? <laughs> And after learning a little bit more about when the Tonys were created in 1947 and whom they were created for, we've, we found ourselves here in West Side Story. What do you got? That feels like original choreo. <laughs> With the toe touch. <laughs> this is just really cool to see represented. And here is Don Grilly's script of West Side Story from 1960. That's amazing. As well as Don Grilly's jacket. Almost as amazing as this. We've got a costume piece from Hello Dolly here. The headpiece was worn by uh, Winifred Sanderson herself, Bette Midler, <laughs> as well as Mother Gothel, Donna Murphy, and the Wicked Stepmother in the Brandy version of Cinderella, Bernadette Peters. Nice, uh, nice little six degrees of separation there. Love that. Yeah, no, no Armageddon this time. But and then the gown was also worn by Bernadette Peters. Got some more Hello Dolly. I just love all this stuff that they have in each of the rooms too. Like original telegrams, original scripts, original revised notes. Oh, and we're working our way into Cabaret where I think we have a photo op. Now a little behind the scenes. Museums are kind of hard to show on camera because it's like. We don't want to show you every single plaque and thing. That's not fun to look at on camera. Plus, we don't want to spoil all the details in the museum if you want to come here yourself. But I will give you a rundown of this cabaret section right here. It tells the tale of a woman uh, named Moira Rose and how she's in a small town and decides to revive the small town musical. So she has her future son-in-law as well as uh, the owner of the motel and her husband's business partner come team up for a rendition of Cabaret and Stevie Bud just knocks it out of the park, surprising everyone. Um, and that is the historical significance of Cabaret. So I've taken the mic back because that f didn't feel like what I read on the plaque. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna dive into the 60s. Let the sun shine. Hair. We took a moment to learn a little bit about Stephen Sondheim and really perform admirably on an anagram. But now we're here celebrating company with Molly really showing us her choreography skills. Truly a dancer. <laughs> you know what? I would never have guessed. I would never have guessed. <gasps> The Wiz. This is from The Wiz Live in 2015, but on the TV here, they're showing us stuff from the actual Wiz. There's a commercial. Oh, we love this. Oh, and we're gonna ease on down the road. This is awesome. We're gonna ease on down the road right here. This is cool. And from The Wiz, now to a chorus line with some of the finale costumes used and the amazing setup that they had there. Wow, these are so crazy to see. Oh my, it's a great many mirrors. A trick used by a chorus line to drastically increase the number of performers that were on stage by a variety of reflections. So very many. So we found ourselves in a corner with Annie with the sun will come out tomorrow, but I want to direct your attention here which is a collection of artifacts from Annie's dog trainer. This is the most important thing in the exhibit. Sandy and Arf, I'm dead, I love it. <gasps> Their signature. This is important, this is important stuff right here. Super trooper, lights are gonna find me. It's cats. Oh, wow. Look at all the sketches. Growl tiger. Unfortunately, oh, this is one of the Siamese cats. yeah. Unfortunately, we have no rum tum tugs or Mr. Mistopheles. No, but we do have McCavity. 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 I love cats, mostly the movie, but about to take a turn in the mood here just for a moment. It seems like uh, learning a little bit more about Lacasia Foley's, which I 
sorry, I definitely am pronouncing it incorrectly, but um, this was a play written about uh, being out and celebrating love regardless of who it was with. And as I read more, it talks about how it uh, quinc uh, coincidentally came out around the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. So we're moving into a little section about that. The AIDS epidemic hit the theatrical community hard. We prematurely lost an entire creative class of people. The names on the wall are many of those that we lost to AIDS and related illnesses. Whew. You would go into rehearsal, and before you could get to previews, friends, colleagues, and coworkers would have disappeared. Many became sick and landed in the hospital. Some would come out. Many more would not. Oof. Learning a little bit more about um, Broadway Cares, the nonprofit that works with Broadway to this day. Oof. Sobering, for sure. I, I hear the phantom. Alan, Alan is excited. We're into the Andrew Lloyd Webber section. Yeah, we are. Here we go. More cats what the people want. Give the people what they want. It's more cats. Get excited, Alan. Excited. He's right there. This is so much wider than I thought it was. <laughs> Am I just big or is Christine small? No, she's very small. Wow. Bum, 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 bum. If you're unaware, Phantom is Alan's favorite musical. We actually came up earlier this year to see it before it closed on Broadway after being the longest running show in history. This is awesome. These costumes are really cool. Oh, and the little monkey. The music box. So every single crystal in this installation represents a show of Phantom that was performed on Broadway in its 35 year run. Including previews, that's 13,997 performances. Amazing. <laughs> this crystal display that shows the mask, when you look at it just right, is like the coolest thing in this museum so far. Except for one thing. The phantom shoes. Just look at those. He is an icon of, of style and design. <laughs> and being a grade A creep. But at least he's got style while he's doing it. No, you cannot defend the Phantom. He is a grade-A creep. And up next we have Rent. Someone's excited. Rent is one of Molly's favorite shows. So she's just living at the moment as we walk through all of the beautiful costumes and some of these just delightful bits of learning about the show. As if we... As if it couldn't be topped. Next we have the Lion King. All of the set pieces, the masks, the puppets are so stunning. I mean, look at this. What could be next? Now we did enjoy the Lion King Instagram filter. Oh, the producers. This is cool. We're in the office. This is awesome. And then we've got, ooh, a whole collection of things. I think this is from a variety of things. Yep, I see an Elsa braid. The more you go to the theater and the more you hear stories that aren't necessarily familiar with, the more you open you become to embracing other perspectives. You know what, I think that is beautiful. So let's see what we got. We've got a model from In the Heights. Just gonna point out a few things I catch my eye. We've got Elsa's braid from Frozen. Boots from Mean Girls. Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster's hats from The Music Man. They're the kinky boots. Oh, the lamp? The lamp from Aladdin. Oh, the earrings from Six. <gasps> I want to see Six so bad. Me too. That's on our list for next time. The, the cast and polo from Dear Ennin Hansen. Hairspray props. <gasps> Cursed Child. Oh, that's cool. Looks like it's the map of Hogwarts. It's the Marauder's map. <laughs> That is a crazy Marauder's map when you look at it closely. I mean, it is the Marauder's map, you're right. Whoa. Also on my list for the next time we're here, MJ the Musical. Look at that bedazzled glove. 
we're in the theater of today now, so we're seeing Avenue Q, and then here's this awesome a Wicked display. It says the audience arrives through the street level foyer, and then they head up into the lobby, or into the theater, and it's like a production in of itself. I want to see Wicked. Have you seen Wicked ever? No. Oh, I've not seen it on Broadway. I've seen it. It's amazing. Add it to the list, our very long, ever-growing list of shows to see. Oh, this is cool. The theater model continues. Here's the behind the scenes. Here's all the people working in the dressing rooms and the sound, the lit, all the lifts. That's cool. We've got Hamilton and Eliza costumes, plus Lynn's boots. They're signed. <gasps> and props. A toast to the groom. To the groom. Wait a minute, hold on. Raise a glass for freedom. They have Playboy bunnies on them. Shut up. They're there, look at it. That's hilarious. I love that on this timeline, they've left years open because who knows what's going to be the success of uh, the current and the, the years to come. But here's a bunch more costumes. We've got things from six. Oh my gosh. That's Harry Potter. It's McGonagall. It's McGonagall. Beetlejuice. Moulin Rouge. She just told us this fabric costs a thousand dollars a yard. My gosh. Make sure you ask the cast members, team members that are working here for fun facts, because she just told us that this one worn by Glenn Close in Sunset Boulevard was hand beaded. And this one back here from the Cher musical was designed by Bob Mackie because he did all of Cher's costumes for her performances. So he came back and did them for the musical too. Shall we? Thank you. We're headed into the making of a Broadway show now. So from what happens on stage to what happens backstage now, we are taking a look at what it takes to actually make a Broadway show run behind the scenes with all the production, stage management, prop movement. Oh my gosh. The sound cues. I'm just so fascinated by all of this as well. Oh, we have a whole host of props. Cup and spoon. Goblet. What's your favorite prop? Fish. Oh, I like meringue on plate. Or clam basket. <laughs> and now we've moved into the musician, composer, lyricist section of the museum. I just find this entire process fascinating, as does Molly, reading through some of the music. But here on the wall we have uh, the book Music and Lyrics from Rent, Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, look at that, Howard Ashman and Alan Minkin. Wicked and the Sound of Music, wow. This is incredibly fascinating. I love how we have a pile of just scrap paper from all the ideas that these folks went through to make this stuff happen. Also on the walls, there are interviews of famous playwrights and composers. Moving to our next kind of behind the scenes room, we're learning about lighting, projection, sound, tools, choreography, all of the things that have to happen to make a show. This museum's really excellent at being interactive and immersive. There's lots of tactile things. There's lots of things to look at. It's really, really well done in here. And here's the important stuff. All the different blood you could use. So that's cool. Gooey, eye blood, mouth blood, okay to eat. Dries, tough to scrape off. Good for aged wounds. Oh, we love an aged wound. Here we have the life cycle of a Broadway show from writing to building the creative team, building the show getting it out of town on Broadway, and then what happens afterwards. In this case, is a high school production. We love that. What a cool representation for the life cycle of a show. I'm learning about the life cycle of a Broadway show, and Molly's in here dancing to Chicago. And of course, we end in a gift shop that has not only gifts, that souvenirs you can purchase from the actual museum, but also from shows that are currently on Broadway, Harry Potter, Hamilton, MJ, Wicked, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the second time today I found a coffee mug that's an appropriate size. But I'm, I'm holding out for the next trip when I can buy that baby Simba and the coffee mug. Overall, I had a great time at the Museum of Broadway. I wasn't 100% sure what to expect, but I loved all the different costumes and set pieces and learning more about some of my favorite musicals and plays, as well as getting inspired to see some others. There's just so much history packed in that museum, and you could lose so much time reading all the different plaques going from vaudeville all the way to today.
That said, I don't know if this is as much of a must-do as some of the other experiences we've had in New York. I think the Museum of Natural History may have more of a wide appeal. I think Spyscape was really fun and interactive. I think there are historic sites that are really interesting as well. However, if you've been to New York a couple of times and are looking for something to do for a few hours, or you're just a massive Broadway fan, I really think you'll enjoy this museum. And speaking of Broadway, we have our own thing we have to go get prepped for. Yeah, we do. It's going to be Jossum. Okay. It's going to be fantastic. Y- you know? Y- y- yeah. It's going to be... I think I'm out, um, but you know we can workshop it. We will workshop it. Uh, we are headed back to change, and we will see you in a moment. Ready for the show? But first, a quick bite to eat. A quick bite to eat. For dinner, we made a quick stop at Pizzeria Perfect Pizza. This is a pizza joint right across from the Richard Rogers Theater, which is where Hamilton plays. It's a classic New York pizza shop ordered by the slice, and what's available is what's available. I really like the white pizza with or without the spinach, and it's a great place to stop and get something quick to eat on your way to the theater. Delicious pizza filling our bellies, and we have finally made it to the reason for this visit. We are at the John Golden Theater to see The Shark is Broken. And yes, it is that shark. The Shark is Broken is a play written by Ian Shaw and Joseph Nixon, and it is about the making of Jaws. Because notoriously, the production of Jaws was terrible. The shark wouldn't work. They went 100 days over timeline. Spielberg was panicked. But what's really special about this show is that Ian Shaw, who wrote this play, stars in it as Robert Shaw, his father, who's Quint in Jaws. So this is like as close as you can get to seeing Robert Shaw perform at this point because he passed away in the 70s. I have been geeking out about the show since I found out about it. It debuted in London a few years ago, then the pandemic hit, it went to Edinburgh, went to Toronto, and now it's finally here in New York City. I'm so, so, so excited to see it. Geeking out right now. And what's even better is we may have a little surprise after the show. Are you excited? Yes. It's gonna be awesome. Fantastic. I'm out. Alan, what? who's your favorite of the job? Oh, sorry, Brittany's playing. A moment for Brittany. Alan, quick question. Who's your favorite of the Jaws trio? Quint. Are you just saying that? Because it, it, okay. mine's Brody, but if anyone asks, it's Quint. Oh. <laughs> no, just, <laughs> I think, I think Ian Shaw would be okay with that. I'm so excited to see this for many, many reasons. Obviously, Ian Shaw, it's about Jaws. There's a bunch of Easter eggs apparently on the Orca set. That's the ship. Uh, that's the set. There's already Easter eggs outside. There's a photo of the of the three main cast members that are recreating a promo photo for Jaws where they're in the teeth of a great white shark. Alongside Ian Shaw, you've got Alex Brightman, who plays Richard Dreyfus, who's playing Matt Hooper. It's a little meta in that way. Musical theater fans may know him as having won a Tony for his role in Beetlejuice, the title role there. And then you've also got Colin Doddle, who's playing Roy Scheider, who plays Chief Brody. I, I'm like giddy right now. How excited are you? You know what, as excited as I am, I'll never be as excited as you are about this. That's probably true, but I'm so excited, and I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad we're here, and Ian Shaw's in there. A play about Jaws. It's the dream. We're headed in. Obviously, we can't film the show, but we'll see you after for a fun surprise. We just saw the show, and it was so good. What a great story about those three men. I am... (sighs) That was just... I'm having a hard time putting it to words. All I know is that I enjoyed it immensely. I'm trying to understand if you would enjoy it if you aren't as a diehard Jaws fan. I think yes, but they make a lot of references to things and people in the movie that, and the behind the scenes of the movie. They make references to Carl Gottlieb and Joe Alves and Steven Spielberg, of course, and all the people that Zanuck and Brown that wrote and produced and directed the movie, which, I don't think if you aren't a diehard Jaws fan, you would catch those, but I don't know that that matters. I think the themes of the play are still really accessible. A lot of it's about sort of a father-son dynamic, which was unexpected for me, um, and how you contend with egos in the same room. It was really cool to watch play out as a theme itself. Yeah, they explored addiction and ego, like you said, and kind of questioning what we are as people and fame and like a lot more than just 
is this mechanical shark gonna work today uh, for this movie? But and they, it's really meta, and they make some really funny jokes. Like at one point, Colin Donnell, who plays Roy Scheider, who plays Chief Brody, is like, "They better not make a second one, and if they do, I'm definitely not gonna be in it." Which he is. Yeah, he, he was contractually <laughs> obligated to be in that. So it's funny. <laughs> but I think the coolest part about what we got to do was, uh, go on, go on. we got to interview Colin Donnell, who played. Roy Scheider and Ian Shaw, who plays his father, Robert Shaw, who was Quentin in the movie. So I'm gonna let uh, past Molly take it away here. So we are here with Ian Shaw, who wrote the play as well as portrays his father in uh, in the show. And so a quick question, you have so many mannerisms similar to your dad. And does that come from reading his diaries, from watching the movie Jaws over and over, or just knowing your dad, or just genetics, do you think? Some of it's from, from watching my dad, and some of it is genetic, I think, you know. Um, yeah, but mostly from watching his performances in, in all his films. Yeah. Do you have a special memory? I know in the program they gave us that little insert where you had a photo of you as a young child uh, sneaking on with Bruce. Do you have a memory from the Jaws set? Oh, I remember, you know, meeting <laughs> Bruce. Yeah. Most of the times, film sets aren't that exciting when you're five years old. <laughs> it's very exciting when you meet, you know, a shark. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, that, that was the <laughs> going on the set. And is there a moment in... I also remember meeting yeah. Steven Spielberg, actually. Was he nice? He was very nice. <laughs> I just thought he was a bit too young to be... <laughs> telling my dad what to do. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and um, do you have a favorite moment in both the movie as well as the play? My favorite moment in the movie is when my dad is singing to uh, Hooper, Richard Dreyfuss. Well, and the affair of Spanish ladies, saying that he's going to die in the shark cage. Um, my, I don't have a favorite bit in the play. I think that would be um, unfair, because it might be my bit or Joseph Nixon's bit. Well, it was amazing. As a Jaws fan, it was incredible. Uh, thank you very much for chatting with us, Ian. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank Appreciate you. It. So were you a Jaws fan prior to doing this play? I mean, I was. I don't think that I knew it as well as I thought I did before we started to get into it. But like, because it's just one of those movies that's yeah. in everybody's head. <laughs> and you think that you know it so well. But then going back and watching it again, I was like, oh. I, I missed so much or misremembered so much but I mean it's such a great film and like yeah. the fact that it was the first of its kind for so many reasons and it I mean 50 years later almost it's still <laughs> such a great movie and it's one thing to be an actor playing a character but you're an actor playing a character who's playing a character yes <laughs> what's the difference I guess in preparing for something like well, that I think that we we really were trying to capture who they were as human beings offset or you know because it's not so much that I'm playing Chief Brody in Jaws I'm playing uh, Roy Scheider as a man yeah um, and so luckily for us there is a lot of you know there's so much uh, footage of them giving interviews as themselves you know they're not in character I mean Obviously, we, I've seen a lot of Roy's work on, on film, and it's such a brilliant career, but it was really cool to see what he was like in, in interviews and, and read about him and, and just see, you know, the kind of person that he was and how he, you know, joked around and was fascinated with little facts and things like <laughs> that. It was great. Um, and you, Chief Brody, and Roy Scheider kind of plays the mediator between... Hooper and Quinn in the movie was. Do you think that was the same on set that he was kind of the mediator between Richard and Robert as well? Yeah, I mean, I think from what we know of, you know, we're taking a stab at uh, at what the reality was as best we can, certainly. And I think Joseph and, and Ian did a great job with the material that they had. Uh, but you know, Roy was kind of the consummate professional, um, and uh, both. Richard and and, uh, and Robert were such outsized personalities that I think he knew that he kind of had to be that staid, um, consummate professional to yeah. be able to sort of wrangle them in, honestly. <laughs> and last question, do you have a favorite part in both the movie and the play? Uh, I think in the movie, it's when he's going eight with the bat. Yes. It's fantastic. <laughs> Get to really see him let loose. 
And I mean, we we have our own moment here in the play. Spoiler: I'm in a speedo, so I wouldn't call it like necessarily my favorite, but it is wonderful to have that moment of you know seeing Roy lose his cool finally after being so um, solid throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Well, it was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thanks. I've peaked. I don't know what. I don't know what else. Does anybody who knew Walt Disney want to talk to us next? <laughs> Bob Gurr, are you around? Because we'll, we'll interview. We uh, we reached out to the Shark is Broken team, and um, they were kind enough to accommodate and arrange some time for us to interview some of the cast and go see the show tonight. So thank you, thank you, thank you, times a million. I mean, tears in my eyeballs when Ian Shaw walked on stage and after our interview. I don't think I could speak after I talked to him. I can confirm. <laughs> Was there was like some difficulty speaking, being, yeah. So, amazing. And uh, now I think to end the night, I have booked us a nightcap at a very, very cool bar with a very cool view of the city. So, let's go. For cocktails this evening, we headed to Dear Irving on Hudson, which is located on the top floors, 40th and 41st of the Elise Hotel near Times Square. It's a penthouse style bar that's got floor to ceiling windows as well as an open air patio. It's kind of got a James Bond art deco throwback vibe as well as great cocktails and food. The bar menu is filled with a variety of craft cocktails specializing in gin and bourbon. They also have a variety of elevated bar snacks, including things like the wakame and avocado bao bun, the lobster guacamole, and a croque monsieur. I picked up the stage name, which is Elijah Craig Small Batch Bourbon, a dash of Falernum, Grand Classico, Gifford Passion Fruit, and Angostura Bitters. This is their take on an old fashioned, and while I did enjoy it, it's a little bit sweeter than I'd prefer. You get a lot of that fruit flavor and then a little bit of sugar coming through, so it doesn't have the bite I'm used to in an old fashioned. It was very, very tasty, but not something I'd order again. And I picked up the Whiskey Business, which besides having a great name is Wild Turkey Rye, Ancho Reyes, Lemon, Cinnamon, and Bitters. It's described as a whiskey backbone with a smoke pepper pop, and while I could definitely taste the whiskey, it had that classic burn on the throat of a strong whiskey drink, and I could taste the cinnamon and lemon, I wanted a little bit more of the chili. It was a good cocktail though, but honestly, when you're paying to go somewhere like this, you're going for the view. Out on the terrace, it was absolutely incredible. We could see the Empire State Building, we could see the Chrysler Building. New York City is so beautiful all lit up, so even though these the best cocktails I've ever had, not even the best cocktails I've had in New York, I would recommend visiting here for the view alone. Well, friends, that brings us to the end of another wonderful stay in New York. So what was your favorite part? Pizza. No, Jaws, obviously. I mean, eat chop. Yeah, I think the shark is broken is 100% going to be the highlight of this trip. I mean, we also did have great pizza. We also went and had some amazing Mexican food, some great tacos. We had an amazing view and tour guide at the Empire State Building and also had true. a good time at the Museum of Broadway. It's a good trip. I love this city. It is always a fun time whenever we come to New York and I, I just, there's always more to do too, so. There is so much more to do in New York, so let us know what we should do next time we're here, what shows we should see, what city should we venture in next. Oh yeah. In the meantime, friends, be sure to like the video, subscribe if you're new, follow us on all of our socials, and if you want to join in the conversation, join us on Discord. All those links down below. And until next time, friends, I'm Molly. And I'm Alan. And it has been Jawsome. It has been fantastic, it hasn't has. it? Yes, thank you. you now, farewell and adieu to you for Spanish ladies. Farewell and adieu to you ladies of Spain. Roll over white. I have a flight in so few so hours. So few hours. So few hours. All right, sleepy time. Bye now. Goodbye.